Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Keysight Technologies Fiscal Fourth Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Joel, and I will be your lead operator today. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please dial star zero. This call is being recorded today, Tuesday, November 19th, 2024, at 1.30 p.m. Pacific time. I would now like to hand the call over to Paulina Sims, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, Ms. Sims. Thank you, and welcome everyone to Keysight's fourth quarter earnings conference call for fiscal year 2024. Joining me are Keysight's President and CEO, Satish Dhanashekaran, and our CFO, Neil Doherty. In the Q&A session, we will be joined by Chief Customer Officer, Mark Wallace. The press release and information to supplement today's discussion are on our website at investor.keysite.com under financial information and quarterly reports. Today's comments will refer to non-GAAP financial measures. We will also make reference to core growth, which excludes the impact of currency movements and acquisitions or divestitures completed within the last 12 months. The most directly comparable GAAP financial metrics and reconciliations are on our website, and all comparisons are on a year-over-year basis unless otherwise noted. We will make forward-looking statements about the financial performance of the company on today's call. These statements are subject to risks and uncertainties and are only valid as of today. We assume no obligation to update them and encourage you to review our recent SEC filings for a more complete view of these risks and other factors. Lastly, management is scheduled to participate in upcoming investor conferences hosted by Wells Fargo and Barclays. And now, I will turn the call over to Satish. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My comments will focus on three key headlines. First, Keysight executed well and delivered fourth quarter revenue and earnings per share about the high end of our guidance range under market conditions which remain consistent with our expectations. Orders finished slightly above our expectations and grew 1% year over year and 8% sequentially, driven by ongoing strength in AI and strong year-end bookings in our U.S. aerospace, defense, and government business. Second, strong execution and cost discipline drove full-year revenue of $5 billion and earnings per share of $6.27, which were down from record highs of 2023. Results were paced by gradual improvement throughout the year with better performance in the second half as expected. Under challenging market conditions, we demonstrated the resilience of our business model by delivering 26% operating profit and over $900 million in free cash flow. We also returned approximately 50% of free cash flow to shareholders through repurchases. Third, we progressed our software-centric solution strategy by investing to realize organic growth opportunities through innovation and industry collaborations while expanding the breadth of our solutions through selective M&A. As we look ahead, the strength of our differentiated portfolio, deep engagement with customers, and the accelerating pace of technology innovation gives us confidence in our ability to outperform as markets recover. Now let's begin with an overview of Keysight's fourth quarter business performance. Communication Solutions Group revenue was flat year over year and grew 6% sequentially with growth across both commercial communications and aerospace defense and government. CSG orders returned to growth for the full year, reflecting AI momentum in wireline, stability in wireless, and consistent strength in ADG. In wireline markets, demand remains strong due to ongoing expansion in AI data center infrastructure, even as telco investments continue to be muted. As the timeline for 800 gig and 1.6 terabit adoption accelerates, the industry is investing in advanced technologies, including 
silicon photonics, chiplets, and high-speed electrical and optical interconnects. Keysight continued to expand its portfolio of solutions across the technology stack to enable customers in both R&D and manufacturing. At the Open Compute Project in San Jose, Keysight showcased our newly introduced AI workload and system emulation solution in collaboration with Academia and Hyperscalers. Our solution provides high fidelity emulation of AI model training and inferencing workloads to optimize training time and benchmark AI infrastructure performance. At ECOG conference, Keysight showcased physical and protocol layer solutions with industry leaders to enable 800 gig interoperability with critical optical and electrical interface technologies. In wireless, demand was stable as smartphone industry nears the end of its inventory correction and telco capex normalizes from peak levels. Investment continues in open RAN, expansion, ongoing standards progression with emphasis on non-terrestrial networks and early 6G research. This quarter, we announced multiple ORAN collaborations with industry leaders such as NTT Docomo, Dish Networks, and Pegatron. We also collaborated with Qualcomm to establish industry's first end-to-end -end interoperability and data connection in the candidate frequency band for 6G, FR3. We're also well poised to drive industry innovation forward with our differentiated full stack solutions. Turning to aerospace, defense, and government, stronger than expected seasonality drove orders to an all time high. The funnel of opportunities remains strong. The US defense budget is expected to grow low single digits, while government investment in defense modernization in Europe and Asia is projected to increase. Customer engagements on electromagnetic spectrum operations, radar, and advanced communication use cases remains high. Satellite communication investments is expected to continue as more LEOs constellations are launched over the next few years. Keysight is capitalizing on the growing investment in defense modernization around the globe. At the recent European Microwave Conference, we showcased our leading capabilities in phased array, over-the-air, compact antenna design and test, in collaboration with analog devices. We also highlighted our latest flagship performance network analyzer. Its differentiated and industry-leading capabilities include wideband, high dynamic range, pre-selected receivers for faster S-parameter measurements to enable customers high-frequency component designs. Turning to Electronic Industrial Solutions Group, revenue was down year over year as expected, but grew mid-single digits sequentially. Orders were mixed with year-over-year -year growth in semi and general electronics offset by automotive market headwinds. In semiconductor, robust demand drove strong order growth for our parametric wafer test solutions. We saw broad-based foundry investment to expand capacity and address leading edge applications driven by AI. This included advanced DRAM technologies such as high bandwidth memory and DDR5, as well as silicon photonics. Enabling further advances in power semiconductor production and efficiency, this quarter, Keysight introduced an innovative single pass, three kilovolt high, high voltage wafer test solution. In automotive, the industry is facing challenges and we expect the headwinds to continue in 2025. This quarter, production related demand was sequentially stable while we saw incrementally cautious pending due to slowing EV sales and battery oversupply. Even with near-term headwinds, we remain focused on customers' emerging innovation and design needs. Our R&D engagements for software-defined vehicle as well as broader electrical and physical design applications remain high. ESI grew its solution business this year through steady renewals and new customer additions. Over this period, the ESI team also made significant contributions through the use of AI to improve product performance simulations and offering workflow solutions with immersive visualization to validate assembly and servicing. In general electronics, 
we saw stable manufacturing demand, albeit at lower levels, and a modest sequential improvement in consumer and industrial high-speed connectivity applications. Public and private sector investment in support of advanced research and technology workforce development grew this quarter and digital health application demand was again strong. Turning to software and services, revenues grew 8% this quarter and accounted for 39% of total Keysight revenue. Annual recurring revenue from software and services also grew 16% to approximately 1.5 billion and, and accounted for roughly 30% of Keysight overall. We saw solid growth in our design engineering software portfolio in 2024, reflecting the expansion of virtual prototyping across a broad range of industries. As, as a recognized thought leader in RFEDA, Keysight was selected to lead a U.S. government joint public and private sector effort to leverage AI and machine learning to automate and bring efficiencies to complex RF integrated circuit designs. In summary, Keysight has continued to sustain strategic progress and momentum through the downturn. The flexibility and discipline of our operating model has proven our ability to deliver strong financial results and healthy cash flows in a variety of economic conditions. We have positioned the business to emerge stronger as markets recover, to capitalize on the opportunities ahead of us, and to create value for all stakeholders. Before I conclude, I'd like to sincerely thank our employees once again for all their outstanding contributions, commitment, and strong track record of execution under a variety of market conditions. With that, I'll turn it over to Neil to discuss our financial performance and outlook. Thank you, Satish, and hello, everyone. Fourth quarter revenue of $1,287,000,000 was above the high end of our guidance range and down 2% or down 5% on a core basis. Orders of $1,345,000,000 were up 1% as reported, or down 1% on a core basis. Backlog increased $53 million in the quarter to finish at $2.4 billion. Looking at our operational results for Q4, we reported gross margin of 64.5%. Operating expenses of $497,000,000 were up 5% year over year, Q4 operating margin was 26%, or 28% on a core basis. Turning to earnings, we achieved $288 million of net income and delivered earnings per share of $1.65. Our weighted average share count for the quarter was 174 million shares. For the full year, Keysight generated revenue of $4,979,000,000, down 9% as reported, or down 12% on a core basis. Gross margin was 65%, down 60 basis points versus the prior year. We sustained investment in R&D at $871 million, or 17.5% of revenue, while driving further operating efficiencies in SG&A, which declined 7%, excluding acquisitions. Full year core operating margin of 26.5% was down 370 basis points, continuing to outperform Keysight's down cycle model and demonstrating the financial resilience of the business. Net income of $1.1 billion resulted in earnings per share of $6.27. Moving to the performance of our segments, the Communication Solutions Group generated fourth quarter revenue of $894 million, flat as reported or down 2% on a core basis. Commercial communications revenue of $591 million grew 4%, while aerospace, defense, and government revenue of $303 million declined 6%. Altogether, CSG delivered gross margin of 67% and operating margin of 28%. The Electronic Industrial Solutions Group generated revenue of $393 million, down 6% or 11% on a core basis. EISG reported gross margin of 58% and operating margin of 21%, an increase of approximately 100 basis points versus the prior quarter. Moving to the balance sheet and cash flow, we ended the quarter with $1.8 billion in cash and cash equivalents, 
generating cash flow from operations of $359 million and free cash flow of $328 million. Share purchases this quarter totaled 974,000 shares at an average price per share of approximately $154 for a total consideration of $150 million. Full year share purchases totaled $439 million or 49% of the $905 million in free cash flow generated this year. Now turning to our outlook. We expect the demand environment to remain mixed and for recovery to occur gradually through the year, barring any further macro degradation. Our base case assumptions for FY25 are for revenue growth at the low end of our 5 to 7% long-term target and earnings growth in line with our 10% target. As a reminder, the timing of ESI's annual contract renewals typically results in 40 to 45% of their full year revenue being recognized in our fiscal first quarter, with the balance recognized relatively evenly over the remainder of the fiscal year. For the rest of the business, we are modeling the typical mid-single digit seasonal decline in revenue from Q4 to Q1. As a result, we expect first quarter revenue to be in the range of $1 billion $265 million to $1 billion $285 million and Q1 earnings per share in the range of $1.65 to $1.71 based on a weighted diluted share count of approximately 174 million shares. Now a few modeling considerations for the full year. Given the annual ESI contract renewals in Q1, we expect a material sequential decrease in ESI revenue in Q2, and over the same period, we expect a low single-digit increase in core key site revenue. At current debt levels, annual interest expense is expected to be approximately $70 million. Capital expenditures are expected to be approximately $150 million, and we are modeling a 14% non-GAAP effective tax rate for FY25. With that, I will now turn it back to Paulina for the Q&A. Thank you, Neil. Operator, will you please give the instructions for the Q&A? Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to ask a question, press star one. We ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. To withdraw your question, press star two. Please hold while we compile the Q&A roster. The first question comes from the line of Aaron Rakers from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the question and congrats on the results. Um, I guess my first question is I, I want to ask you about the, the wireless piece of the business. Uh, it seems to be recovering. I, I think it was kind of, you know, mid single digit, if I'm correct, from the presentation order growth in the quarter. I'm just curious of how you, you know, I guess the past conversations have said, suggested that's more of a stabilizing business as we move through this year. Uh, has that started to change? Has your view uh, of growth kind of recovery in that business, uh, you know, started to evolve or deepen, you know, as we look through this next fiscal year? Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Um, indeed, a good quarter. We executed well and capitalized on the opportunities we saw. Specific to your question on wireless, uh, we continue to uh, feel more confident, I would say, after two quarters where the business has stabilized, and we're seeing more strengths on the infrastructure side where there's more activity from customers around Open RAN and 6G research, so that drives that. And on the, uh, on the devices side, uh, it's lagging a little bit where customers still continue to be focused on ongoing standards evolutions. So, I mean, at this point, we continue to believe that uh, the business will remain stable uh, in 25. We'll, we'll call it when we see it. Uh, but we, we, we continue to uh, feel good about the ongoing momentum we're seeing in our wireline business uh, that's driven growth for commercial communications. Yep. And then as a quick follow-up, kind of sticking with looking at some of the segments, the aerospace and defense segment, I'm curious because this question's come up with some investors. Uh, you know, it sounds like you're pretty confident that that business continues to progress on the, on the growth profile that you outlined. Um, but, you know, have you seen any, you know, areas of concern or any kind of, you know, churn in, in programs, et cetera, around some of the federal dynamics uh, of spend? Uh, any, any uncertainties around that that you would point to? 
Yeah, I think, um, the, uh, Aaron, the long-term uh, trajectory of that business is actually the one that is easiest to forecast given the budget uh, clarity that uh, typically gets uh, and the priorities that get set both in the U.S. and in allied nations. And if you look at electromagnetic spectrum operations, space and satellite and other areas, um, those are the areas where defense modernization investments are moving to, and we feel good about our position. Uh, relative to the year, obviously, orders were slightly down uh, year over year, but off of a record compared from a year ago. And some of the wins that we had were systems wins, uh, which take us a little longer to ship, so you haven't yet seen that. Uh, in, in the revenue line. But as we look ahead, obviously, the short term uh, with the administration change in the U.S. does bring some uncertainties. But even at times, uh, like in 2016, where that happened, uh, we just had some business morale between quarters. And, um, and so we'll, we'll monitor the situation, but we feel good about the current situation with regard to our business there. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Rob Mason with Baird. Your line is now open. I apologize. The next question is from Tim Wong with Barclays. Your line is now open. Thank you. Um, yeah, two for me as well. Um, first, could you uh, you mentioned um, AI leading the strength in in wireline? Obviously, a lot going on there a lot of activity could you maybe expand a little bit on on how big that business is getting for you and maybe some examples of uh, newer areas that uh, keysight is being pulled into um, because of uh, the move in ai uh, and then the second one i just wanted to follow up on the the software services um, you know up to 39 percent of revenues here um, maybe just talk a little bit about uh, that evolving part of the business model and how um, how, how Keysight's going to be able to move that number further and maybe impact on, on gross margin as that, uh, as that moves higher as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tim. Uh, clearly, you know, the Warline business um, has gained momentum this year uh, driven by AI, but this is one of the examples of proof of concepts that I highlighted at Investor Day uh, last year. And so, we're quite pleased with the way the opportunity has progressed. Uh, our wireline business has exceeded over a billion dollars in orders this year, growing at double-digit rates. Um, and we service a broad set of customers um, in that industry, right? You think about silicon designers, system integrators, NEMs, hyperscalers, and contract manufacturers. So it's actually a broad set of customers. But what's driving the activity in AI right now is actually a concentrated set of uh, customers from hyperscalers that are investing in uh, in large uh, infrastructure upgrades. So that's the effort. And the supply chain right now continues to be constrained. So the investments are being made to unlock the supply chain to enable uh, the, the scale to build. And so we're involved in that and we're capitalizing on that. But as we think about the future, we participated in some forums like the OCP and ECOC earlier this year, and you can start to see the scale expand. It's not yet reflected in the results yet, but we start to build scale around compute, whether it's centralized or at the edge, uh, power and thermal being very big issues for companies. Networking technologies are being adopted, maybe even faster than they were being adopted before this uh, AI became a big trend. And, um, and our opportunities we're excited about are not just in the physical layer, but in the protocol layer, allowing customers to emulate how traffic flows through an AI infrastructure and uh, therefore optimize their investment. So we're pretty excited about the opportunities long-term here and um, capitalizing on the near-term strength. Yeah, and then as it relates to uh, software and services, obviously continuing to see a nice mix shift uh, towards those portions of our business. Uh, and, you know, as I think a part of your question addressed gross margin, uh, you know, the, the software portions of those businesses are key, accretive to key sites, average gross margin. The, the services portions are slightly dilutive to key sites, average gross margin. Uh, but overall, uh, both, both uh, the, the service business has a lower expense structure, so both contribute nicely to profitability when you think about it from the operating margin line. 
and then Tim, I would just add this is Mark okay. as far as the expansion. You know, it's it's we've shown that it's more resilient to the the current macro. Uh, customers continue to invest in new methods, uh, shifting left on um, virtual simulation and emulation of their systems to help reduce costs and increase efficiencies, and we're seeing that. And then the second part, of course, is the further leverage of of some of our our new assets like ESI uh, being exposed to more of our customers in different regions, the U.S. for aerospace defense, parts of Asia, uh, with the broad key site footprint in those regions. We see that as a driver for additional growth as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. The next question is from Rob Jamieson with Vertical Research Partners. Your line is now open. Hey guys, um, congrats on the quarter. Um, just a couple of quick ones for me. Just first on um, on the communications business, just uh, what kind of benefit could we see from bead funding just in second half of 25? I mean, is there much benefit there if that, that funding does get actually released um, and finally comes to fruition? And then I guess, you know, also any potential risk of that, you know, um, being reversed, just given some of Trump's advisors at, at this point that are that have been anti-bead funding. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the good thing about key sites business model in, in comms and in fact, the rest of our business is the broad set of customers we serve. That diversity and breadth is a, is a source of great strength uh, during times of change. And so... Uh, while we do pick up, um, uh, you know, some some incremental business every year from new logos that come up uh, because they're funded directly or indirectly, there are some direct funding from government at times that flows into open RAN. And we've called some of those wins out and even the CHIPS Act, but we're not heavily tethered to any one of those things. So I would just say that uh, those are uh, incremental uh, in some ways, but not, not as... Uh, uh, as material as uh, as maybe the headlines would suggest, especially because we're more involved in the R&D side of um, of those labs, and um, and so we feel good. I think the momentum we see because of our renewed focus on go-to-market expansion that we had put in place uh, with marketing is the continued attraction of new logos that we see in our, across our business. It continues to be the focus for us uh, moving forward as well. That, that's really helpful. I appreciate that. Um, and then I guess just on, you know, uh, uh, Terrace, just real quick, and just uh, you guys have been dealing with this in one way or another for over eight years. Can you just talk about, you know, your previous strategies around, you know, your pivots in the APAC region, just, you know, whether it's been Yahweh, ZTE, or, you know, even the Trump tariffs, just how you've kind of managed that in the past? Yeah, I would just say, you know, it, it, it's it's probably uh, it's a question behind the question. If I'm if I'm understanding you right, is what are the implications of the U.S. Uh, elections and therefore the policy changes that may ensue? And so, like everybody, we're monitoring uh, three areas: tax, trade, uh, both tariffs and uh, trade restrictions, right? Uh, areas, and along with defense spending uh, that might ensue, um, it would be premature for us to uh, comment on them except to say that, uh, you know, we've been pretty agile in, in ensuring compliance when there is a new government restriction and pivoting our sales resources to go after new opportunities. A potential offset could be, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, breaking my rule and speculating a little bit, is if there were to be tariffs of the orders being discussed, many companies are looking to more of China into other areas in Southeast Asia, and uh, we remain prepared to capitalize on the opportunities if, should that occur? Got it. So similar to like what we saw with reshoring and everything during uh, supply chain disruptions, you know, the benefit that we saw there. Exactly. Exactly. Great, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Rob Mason with Baird. Your line is now open. Good afternoon. And uh, again, nice jump on the quarter. Uh, just with respect to your uh, thoughts around 2025 revenue, Satish, I know you, you covered some of the segments, but just at a high level, uh, I mean, is it is it fair to think you think um, all of your major, you know, I'll say segments, uh, again, we're talking wireline, wireless, 
automotive, general electronics, some of these uh, you know, verticals. Would all of them have an opportunity to grow in 25, do you think, you know, within the kind of mid-single digit the profile that you're talking about? Automotive sound like maybe it was the most challenged, but um, I'd just yeah. like to get your thoughts there around. Yeah, that's good. Look, our job number one, uh, Rob, was to uh, stabilize the business and return to order growth, which we set out as a priority for the second half, and I'm quite pleased that we've executed to that. Uh, now, just looking at the facts, you'd say CSG has returned to growth um, in, in the, for the full year from an order perspective, and EISG um, is yet to do that. So that sort of summarizes the mixed demand environment. And just projecting forward, we expect continued sort of slow, gradual recovery as we move into 2025. We're not baking in, in our base case, um, all segments uh, inflecting. And should that happen, uh, we'll be prepared to capitalize on it. But our base case that Neil's called out um, at, in his um, outlook section is for 5% uh, revenue growth and 10% EPS growth for the year. Yes. Okay, that's helpful. Um, just as a follow-up, and maybe this directed to Neil, just, uh, you know, with the higher ESI revenue in the first quarter, you know, the I would assume that the gross margin, you know, will reflect that at least sequentially. Um, you know, could you maybe give us a little bit of, th of thoughts around your OPEX as you trend in, you know, from fourth quarter into first quarter? There's often some some resets. I know seasonality as well influences that, but I'm just, you know, kind of curious what kind of trajectory OPEX is, is on as you enter the new year. Yeah, let, let me just touch on a couple of seasonality related comments since you since you've opened the door to that. I think first of all, I, as you mentioned with regard to gross margin, uh, with the you know sizable uptick in, in ESI revenue. Uh, we would expect some gross margin uh, upside, uh, you know, from that business in, in Q1. Uh, similarly, though, then as you move from Q1 to Q2, you have reverse effect as that revenue comes out of uh, comes out of the model. So just to, to, just if you put it on one side, you got to take it out on 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 the other side. With regard to opex, uh, just uh, in reminding you of some things that are kind of the norm for Keysight. We do do salary administration for the entire company here in the first quarter of the year, so that will be uh, impacting uh, the p and l starting uh, starting essentially now and then, as the business inflects from a period of contraction back to a period of growth, we have uh, essentially a, our, our variable pay programs turning back on, uh, which will uh, you know increase opex here in the, starting in the first half of next year. Very good. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Matt Nicknum with Deutsche Bank. Your line is now open. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you so much for taking the question. Um, on macro, I'm curious if you can speak to how that backdrop has evolved over the last quarter. Because it seems like there's some pockets that are getting better yet. It seems like others like auto that are maybe a little bit softer. So any general commentary on the macro backdrop you can provide. And then um, just as a follow-up on aerospace defense, um, can you talk about maybe what changed later in the quarter? You mentioned the very strong closeout uh, to the quarter, particularly around the U.S. Um, just curious in terms of, you know, what, changed and how maybe that's trended uh, into the start of fiscal 1Q. Thanks. Yeah, why don't I start by making some comments about macro and that we'll, then we'll let Mark Wallace make some comments about the broader aerospace defense business. You know, so first of all, as Satish mentioned in, in uh, his prepared comments, uh, you know, the results in Q4 were, were marginally better than we expected coming into the quarter. And so I think that's possible. A lot of that strength itself was in aerospace defense, and so Mark will talk about that. But I think as you as you think about macro changes, uh, and, the, and the previous question alluded to this as well, I think the automotive business is where we're seeing the most pressure, significant pullback in spend around uh, EV uh, development at this point in time, which is uh, which is impacting that industry pretty significantly. I think if you if you look across broader strength and wireline. Stability, maybe not yet a strong catalyst for growth and wireless, but at least stability, uh, nice uh, forward momentum in aerospace defense, 
I think with with regard to semi, it's a question of timing. Uh, you know, when do I think everybody's optimistic about a turn back on in semi? The question is, when does that really begin in earnest? And then the industrial end markets, uh, you know, maybe maybe the biggest question mark because I think some of that is going to be tied to uh, how how a lot of that capacity that was put in place during the uh, 21, 22, 23 supply chain disruptions. Uh, over what time is that capacity fully absorbed and people start to once again reinvest in, in manufacturing capacity? So that's kind of how we're thinking through the end markets from a macro perspective. Yeah, and Matt, I think the aerospace defense, as Satish talked about, the, the the focus on defense modernization has remained a top priority in the U.S. and allied nations. We had continuing resolution in the first part of last fiscal year, the government fiscal year 24, which put some delays on new program starts. So as we entered into the fourth quarter with the government fiscal year end in September, um, we saw you know increased spend as we would normally see, which was not certain because of delays in the budgeting process. So that was a big positive. Um, we see continued uh, investments from the prime contractors as well as the direct government in the U.S. and the prime contractors in Western Europe as well, as we've been talking about for many quarters due to the geopolitical situation that continues to unfold. Uh, so those factors come together. Um, and then, you know, longer term, I think the areas that are, are, are promising for us continue to be around EMSO, um, space and satellite, and, and quantum it, with some of the government-funded research that's occurring in all parts of the world continue to offer us opportunities over the, the coming quarters. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Samik Chatterjee with JP Morgan. Your line is now open. Hi, um, thanks for taking my question. Um, I guess for my first one, Satish, if I can go back to um, your comments earlier about not really embedding um, sort of inflection in all of the businesses and your 5% growth target for uh, fiscal 25, uh, how should I think about um, what kind of recovery or what your expectations are embedded in for semi-cap and general electronics? Um, seems like bo um, both are a bit mixed in terms of what you're seeing, but if you can just outline how you're thinking about um, those two areas in particular, and I have a quick follow-up after that. Thank you. Thank you, Samik. I think for semiconductor fabs, so just based on what we're seeing and the pipeline of opportunities we see uh, for our wafer test solutions around silicon photonics and new memory topologies and uh, some of the uh, higher higher voltage uh, types of uh, wafers, uh, I think that strength continues for us in somewhat a little bit offset by, and that's the bigger part of our semi business, somewhat offset by um, a slowdown that a uh, number of the semiconductor equipment manufacturers have reported as well. So uh, you put that in the mix, uh, we still think semi grows uh, from from these levels um, for us. And again, semiconductor is, uh, as, you, as you know, is roughly 10% of our total uh, revenue at the company level. Um, from a general electronics perspective, what we've started to see, and again, one quarter doesn't make a trend, so I just want to caution you, but I do think in Q4 we saw stability in manufacturing, uh, which finally uh, resulted in, uh, in you, you know, the underlying strength in research spending around next generation technologies, the broad new customer logo, all of that returned that business to growth. Again, it's just one quarter, but uh, we, we think that um, that stability in manufacturing continues as we move forward as well, which should uh, which should give some uh, which should return which should which should put EISG on return to order growth at some point in the year. Uh, it's uh, you know difficult to call at this point. Okay, okay, fine. And if I follow up, maybe this is more for Neil. I think Neil, a question you're getting a lot from investors is when they look at some of your previous margin targets um, that were a bit more longer term for fiscal 26, you're not really that much different at this point from a gross margin perspective where the guidance was 66 to 67, but you're significantly at a gap to your operating margin target of 31 to 32. Um, how should we think about the drivers and sort of beyond volume leverage, how you're thinking about other drivers that get you closer to that um, target, or is there something that sort of needs to be re-evaluated relative to those targets? Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd say a couple things. You know, so first of all, I think we're we're pleased with how gross margins have have held up uh, on the downside of the cycle. 
Um, obviously, we've gotten some benefit here from the addition of the ESI software business, but even if you look at the core key site business, the gross margins have held up pretty well in total uh, on, on the downside of the cycle. I think when you start to think about those targets that we put out, 66 67% operating margin targets, where, again, you know, we're 150, 200 basis points off of that uh, at, at current levels, uh, and, uh, you know, but we're significantly further off on the operating margin line. I think you need to look at the impact that the acquisitions are having in the short run, where we've made some acquisitions that are creative to gross margins, but significantly diluted to operating margins. And I think as we uh, get those businesses integrated and, uh, you know, uh, st- start to operate them within the greater uh, Keysight operating model, there's going to be opportunity for us uh, to drive significant uh, profit leverage uh, on those acquisitions and start to close that gap on the on the operating margin side of things. And, and Samik, we remain uh, confident in the long-term growth opportunities uh, of this business. And you've seen when we can deliver above model growth rates, the sort of earnings power and leverage we have, uh, we continue to operate this business in a disciplined way to be able to realize those and get us back on track. No, sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Mita Marshall with Morgan Stanley. Your line's now open. Hi, this is Karan on for Mita. Congrats on the quarter. Um, so just starting on the automotive side, um, clearly you remain quite positive on simulation, but outside of that, are there any other exposures um, that you have with an auto that could cause a pickup in the business outside of maybe EV sales improving? And then I have a follow-up. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So there's several parts to automotive. Uh, the the part that we're seeing the the slowdown and and project delays is around EV investments that have been quite robust over the last several years with battery test labs. So we're seeing a pause in that. We're seeing manufacturing demand also stay lower levels, but that's another part of our business that you know as uh, inventories normalize that we should see some increasing. Uh, flow through of manufacturing test for that. The part that's remained um, steady is the software-defined vehicles or the ADAS, the autonomy side, where we have uh, continued innovation crossing over multiple parts of our business into communications, uh, sensor technology, and so forth. And a lot of that is software as well. So there's uh, there's a lot of work being done in in that frame. The other one that doesn't get as much attention, at least from uh, from these calls, but gets a lot of attention on the news, is the infrastructure. So the charging infrastructure and the standards associated with those in every region of the world uh, represents, you know, additional opportunities that we're pursuing. So long-term drivers are of growth, secular drivers around AV, the manufacturing coming back on new advanced technologies remains a, an area of, of focus for us, you know, over many years. Got it. That's helpful. And then coming back to the AI side, um, are there any areas that you see in your portfolio that you could maybe grow content or offer new products to sort of take advantage of the opportunity that you're seeing today? Thank you. Yeah, the uh, no, good question. I think as as we mentioned, the more logical areas uh, which we have seen uh, growth come from to date or results come from to date are associated with the physical layer tools where we provide our oscilloscopes, our sampling scopes, and other tools that we provide. And what we're seeing is a bigger opportunity for our emulation platforms. We're still in early pilots with customer on. Again, it's a small, it's a concentrated set of opportunities today. We expect that industry and the impact AI is going to have to be broader. Um, and we're participating in enabling the ecosystem with the right set of tools all the way from design, emulation to test. And um, and our focus is on the R, enabling our customers in the R and D parts of the workflow, and it's a pretty rich opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from Adam Thalheimer with Thompson Davis. Your line's now open. Hey, good afternoon, guys. Congrats on the beat, and Mark, congratulations on your retirement. Um, hey, thanks, Adam. Wanted to ask first about <laughs> wanted to ask first about the operating margin in communications. I think that was your best ever quarterly operating margin, which kind of took me by surprise. Curious, um, what drove that and what the outlook is there? 
Yeah, so uh, obviously we are uh, very pleased with the results in, in CSG. Gross margins have held up very strong in that business. I think we see a tight, not only do we see a higher software content, higher recurring revenue from software, uh, which obviously helps margins, but I think there's less there's less margin diversity in the in the CSG portfolio than we see on the ESG side, so so less impact from from mix. Uh, you know, from a profitability standpoint, I think we're very pleased that we're keeping our foot on the gas on the on the R and D side, continuing to invest to position ourselves to capitalize on the upside, while driving uh, while driving you know significant efficiencies on uh, and SG and A, resulting resulting in the in the strong profitability. That we saw, so it was, it was the strongest profitability we saw this quarter. Not not an all time record, obviously, but but very strong operating margins uh, in in CSG this quarter. And then in EISG, uh, as you think about the full year, what are the growth offsets to uh, the weakness in auto? You're talking about uh, in 24 and 25. Uh, for fiscal 25, um, uh, what offset yeah, I mean, I think, in auto this year? Yeah, I mean, I think as, as the Chiefs look forward, as we look as we look to semi and to the broader industrial markets, you know, there is reason for optimism with some of the FAB programs and infl- and and you know the absorption of capacity that was put in place uh, in prior years. Uh, again, uh, likely to be more back end loaded. We've talked about at the key site level a gradual improvement through the year, and so uh, you know, as Satish just said, we would expect uh, you know there is an opportunity for for EISG, which is not yet returned to order growth, to do so in the back half of the year, and I think that would be with you know some significant uh, increase in the strength of the semi markets and some modest recovery in, in industrial end markets. Got it. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. The next question is from Mark Delaney with Goldman Sachs. Your line is now open. Hey, thank you for taking my question. You have Will on for Mark Delaney here. Uh, Just one on M&A. So with the proposed spiring transaction still ongoing, will Keysight be open to doing other larger transactions in in the near term if if one that made business and financial sense was available? Yeah, I would just say, look, we have uh, we have reiterated uh, a very strong uh, organic growth strategy that we're focused on realizing. Uh, we've also identified specific markets that we have studied uh, to pursue a selective uh, M&A. Um, and um, and at this point, while we continue to evaluate targets, we'll you know we always remain disciplined and uh, we'll look at them. But it's not a matter of capital as much as um, you know bandwidth to pursue uh, more deals, given uh, given the deals that we've already announced, which we're working through. No, it uh, shouldn't be helpful. Thank you for that. And just one more on capital allocation: um, How should we be thinking about buybacks for fiscal 25? Any cadence, commentary, or any color that you can add there would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, the only thing I would say is that uh, obviously uh, we look forward to the close of the Spiran transaction, which will be a significant capital outlay for the company. Uh, and uh, but we do expect that we will, at a minimum, continue with our buyback program at at least the anti-dilutive level, and then we'll be trying to strike a balance between you know starting to get the cash ready to close the, the Spiran transaction, trade it off against what we might see as opportunities opportunistic opportunities to, uh, you know, to, to do more on the buyback front. Thank you. That concludes our question and answer session for today. I would like to turn the call back to Paulina Sims for any closing comments. Thank you, operator, and thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. This concludes our conference call. You may now disconnect.